Welcome to the notes for 1-10, What's in a Root? This is the second part of yesterday's lesson. We're still going to simplify radical expressions, but our focus today is going to be on rationalizing denominators. And for those of us that maybe don't remember, standard form for a number is that no radical can be left in the denominator. Okay, there are different reasons for this. Uh, some of them are a little bit outdated as we've learned, I don't know, I'm gonna say new math, but as math has evolved over the years. But we still need to understand why we rationalize the denominator, okay? We want to make sure that we're eliminating any irrational number from the denominator. Here's an example. We have two over the square root of six. We know the square root of six is an irrational number. If we took it and typed it into the calculator, it would give us a big, long decimal that doesn't repeat and never ends. Remember, we don't like having decimals in fractions, so we want to get rid of the square root of six from our denominator. The way we normally get rid of square roots is we square it, but we wouldn't end up with a value that was proportional if we tried to square the top and the bottom. So we have to square it but without actually squaring it. We're going to multiply the denominator times itself. So it's like squaring it, but now we can apply the same thing to the top. Remember, if I multiply both the top and the bottom by the square root of six, this is the same thing as multiplying times one. You can multiply anything times one and it's not gonna change the value. We just may change what it looks like. So when I do radical six times radical six, that gives me the square root of 36, which we know is 6. And then we have 2 times the square root of 6 on the top. Only thing left here is to simplify it. We have 2 times the square root of 6. And on the bottom, remember, 6 is 2 times 3. We have that common factor in the top and the bottom. So we now have the square root of 6 over 3. And that is our simplified answer. Remember, that has the same value as this. If you type them both in the calculator, you'll get the same answer. Okay? But now we don't have the irrational number in our denominator. Let's look at some more. Next one, we have the square root of 20 divided by the square root of 3. And there's a variety of ways that you can do these. You could go ahead and just take it and to get rid of that irrational number in the denominator by multiplying by the square root of 3. But I'm going to look at it a little bit differently. I'm going to say here, square root of 20, I'm going to break it down first. We know that's the same thing as 2 times the square root of 5. And the reason I like to do that there is sometimes if I had, say, a square root of 5 in my denominator, right, I could have canceled them out. In this case, it doesn't. So we'll just have to stick with that method we started talking about, where we're going to multiply both the bottom and the top by the square root of 3. So we're going to rationalize the denominator. What we'll end up with here on the bottom, square root of 3 times the square root of 3 is 3. And on the top, I have 2 times the square root of 5 times the square root of 3, which is going to give me 2 times the square root of 15. And the nice thing about already simplifying the top is I don't have to simplify it anymore. It already simplified. Let's look at the next one. I have 4 times the square root of 3 over the square root of 12, and this whole value is negative. Now I could rewrite this. I could rewrite this as a negative 4 times the square root of 3 over the square root of 12. Or we talked about yesterday, if I have two numbers that are being divided and they're both, we're taking the same root of both of them, I can rewrite that as the square root of 3 twelfths in which case I can reduce it to one-fourth. I have negative four times the square root of one-fourth. And now when we look at it there, aren't they both perfect squares? Square root of one is one, the square root of four is two. So this is like negative four times one-half, which gives us negative two. Let's move on. What if we have roots other than square roots? Is the process the same? Okay, please, 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 please listen. I'm going to star this page three times, and I'm going to highlight them. I might even put smiley faces at some point. 
This is what we started trying to teach a little bit in Algebra 2, and I know it confused some people quite a bit. Now you got to learn it. Let's make sure we're focused on what's going on. Okay, now we've been rationalizing our denominator when we have when we had the perfect squares, right? Because this right here, when I multiply them, this is the same thing as the square root of three times three, which we had that pair and we could take out the three. What we need to think about here, I have a negative one over the cube root of two. If I need that to be a perfect cube on the bottom, how many twos do I need? Right, I don't know why I'm putting equals. I need to be putting a multiplication sign. All right, so. In order to make this a perfect cube, right, if I'm taking the cube root, how many more twos do I need? If I have one here, I'm going to need to multiply this by the cube root of two times two. Why? Because then I end up with the cube root of two times two times two, which is eight, which we know is a perfect cube and will give us two. Okay, so I tried to break that apart here so you can see that. When I take this, Oops, wrong thing, highlighter. When I take this and I multiply it times the cube root of two times two, or you could say the cube root of four, right? That's how I end up with all three of those down here. And because I need a cube root, that's what's gonna give me just my two. But remember, if we do that to the bottom, we also have to do it to the top. So we'll do the cube root of two times two. And that's just going to give us negative one times the cube root of four which is just a negative cube root of four in the end. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, let's look at the next one. We have five divided by the cube root of nine. All right, well, let's, let's think about the cube root of nine. I am putting an equal sign on this one. Let's just break this down for a second. This is the same thing as the cube root of three times three. Right, we still have our five on top. So I want you to ask yourself, how many more threes do I need to make that a perfect cube? Right, so when I multiply this by the cube root, I only need one more three. Right now I've got one, two, three. So when I multiply it together, I actually have the cube root of three times three times three, which is going to give us our three in our denominator. Now you don't have to write down all these steps, I just want to make sure that everybody's understanding that part. So if I multiply the bottom by the cube root of three, I need to multiply the top by the cube root of three. And I'm actually gonna just skip over this part, I'm gonna go all the way to the end here. I have five times the cube root of three. And that whole thing is over three, and that is our answer. If you have questions about this, it's important that you mark it down there and that you reach out to me and let me know. Let's move on. How do we rationalize these denominators? So now we have a radical binomial in the denominator. We have two over one plus radical three. Okay, we can't just multiply it by radical three because then we'd have to distribute it through and we'd still have a radical down there. There's this little thing that you guys learned about uh, last year, and we called it the conjugate. The conjugate. And remember, if I had something like an A minus B, if I multiplied it times A plus B, we made a difference of squares. So that when we foiled it out, we'd have A squared, we'd have a plus AB we'd have a minus AB, and then we'd have a minus B squared, right? And these two terms always canceled out, okay? That's what we need to have happen here. So I still have two over one plus radical three, and what I want to do with that is I want to multiply it by the conjugate. So our conjugate here would be one minus radical three. If I do that to the bottom, I must also do it to the top. So what do we end up with now? Well, when we do our denominator as one plus radical three times one minus radical three, you can foil the whole thing out, or you can think about it as being, you know, a squared minus b squared, 
we should end up with 1 times 1 is 1. We know the positive radical 3 and the negative radical 3 in the middle will cancel out. And then we'll have minus radical 3 times radical 3, which is radical 9, or 3. And if I went too fast there, just take your time and foil this out. You should end up with 1 minus 3, which gives you negative 2 at the end. And now when we're looking at the top, right, we're just doing 2 times 1 minus the square root of 3, which when we distribute that through is going to be 2 minus 2 radical 3. And if I think about it there, maybe I don't want to distribute it through, right, because I have a 2 in the bottom. I have a 2 in the top, so if I just left that 2 out, I have 1 minus radical 3 there. I can cancel this 2 with that. And then what do you do with that negative, right? I have 1 minus radical 3 over negative 1. Ew, don't really like doing that. Let's just distribute that negative through, and we have negative 1 plus radical 3. That's the nicest answer that we could leave there. Okay, if I went too quick or if you have questions, please make sure you reach out. But remember, the main thing on this one that we're looking at is the conjugate. So if I have a 1 plus radical 3 to start, okay, the thing that I'm going to multiply by is 1 minus radical 3. So they, the only thing that's different is that sign in the middle. Here's another one. We have 1 minus the square root of 2 over 1 plus the square root of 2. So what do we want to multiply by? We have 1 minus the square root of 2. We do it to the bottom. We're going to also do it to the top. What are we going to get? Well, when we multiply this times this, 1 times 1 gives us 1. Our negative radical 2 and positive radical 2 cancel. And then we have minus the square root of 2 times the square root of 2 is 2. So we're looking at a negative 1 in our denominator. On the top, we're going to have a perfect square trinomial, right? Because we're multiplying the same binomial times itself, or we're squaring it. So we'll have 1 times 1 is 1. Then we'll do our outer terms, which is going to be a negative radical 2. Our inner terms is going to be a negative radical 2. And then a negative radical 2 times a negative radical 2 is going to be a plus 2. Now we're looking at 2 plus 1 is 3 minus 2 radical 2. And again, let's not leave that negative 1 in our denominator. Let's just go ahead and take it through. We've got a negative 3 plus 2 times the square root of 2. Let's move on to the next one. Solve the following miscellaneous equations. So these are just some random equations that we're going to work on trying to solve. The first one says the square root of 3 minus the square root of 7 times x equals 1. Just something I want to point out to you when we see problems like this. This x is not under the radical. It's actually like radical 7 times x. Okay, So it's not under the radical. It may look like it is, but it's not. So we need to isolate that x. So the first thing I would do right, is get rid of what's not attached to the x. I'm referring to that radical 3. When we subtract that from each side, I now have negative radical 7 times x is equal to 1 minus the square root of 3. Okay, next here, we could take it and we need to get rid of that negative radical 7. So let's just divide each side by a negative radical 7. And what we're looking at right now is x equals 1 minus the square root of 3 over negative radical 7. And i tell you what, just as, since we have that negative down there, let's just go ahead here and distribute that through the top. So we have a negative 1 plus the square root of 3 over just a positive radical 7 right now. Oh, wait, we can't leave a radical in the denominator, so we need to get rid of that. So what are we going to multiply by? We're going to multiply by the square root of 7 on the top and the bottom. After that, we we'll end up with negative 1 times radical 7 be a negative radical 7. And then we have plus radical 7 times 3 would be a radical 21. 
And that is going to be over radical 7 times radical 7 is 7. And since the square root of 7 is simplified, the square root of 21 contains no perfect squares. It's simplified. And we're over a rational number. We can conclude that this is our answer. Okay, the next one. We have the square root of 3 times x minus the square root of 7 times x equals 1. Okay, I would make sure that I am definitely listening on this because you're going to see some of this again soon. Okay, how can we combine the x's together if we have those different radicals? We need to have just one x. Well, this is where we are going to factor out our greatest common factor. What's our greatest common factor? x. So we're going to take it, we're going to factor out x. When we do that, we have x times the square root of 3 minus the square root of 7. Right? If I distribute that back through, I'd be back to my original expression. Now to get x by itself, let's just divide each side by the square root of 3 minus the square root of 7. Sorry, that, that parenthesis wasn't very good. I want to do that over here. I guess we don't even need the parentheses, so I'm not going to write it on the second side. Okay, so what we have now is x is equal to 1 over the square root of 3 minus the square root of 7. But we still need to rationalize our denominators. So what's the conjugate going to be for radical 3 minus radical 7? That conjugate is going to end up being the square root of 3 plus the square root of 7. And if I do that on the top and the bottom, right, that's still just 1. Now we can take it and simplify it down. Let's see what we're going to end up with. If I FOIL this quantity times this one, radical 3 times radical 3 is 3. I know that the middle two terms will still cancel out. Then I have minus radical 7 times radical 7 is 7. On the top, 1 times radical 3 plus radical 7. And in the end, I am looking at the square root of 3 plus the square root of 7 over f negative 4, which we can take it then and turn into negative radical 3 minus radical 7 over positive 4. And either of those actually would probably be just fine. But if you have questions, please make sure you reach out. Otherwise, solve the following equation for x. We have 4xy minus 3x equals 2y minus x. All right, so as we look at this one, we've got some different expressions here. We've got expressions with just x. We have one expression that has just a y, and we have this expression that has an x and a y. So for me, what I'm going to look at here, since we're trying to solve 4x, somehow we need to get all the x's together. So let's take this little x that's over here by itself, and let's move it over with the x's on the other side. We now have 4xy minus 2x is equal to 2y. And do you remember in that last problem how we got it to be just 1x? We factored out that greatest common factor of x. So let's do that again. They each have an x there. So we'll pull that x out. And then we've got 4y minus 2 left over. And that's supposed to equal 2y. And just like the last problem, let's just divide each side by 4y minus 2. And we get x is equal to 2y over 4y minus 2. And when we look at that, does that simplify at all? It looks like it may, so let's just go ahead and do that. We need to be able to do that in higher level mathematics. If we look at the bottom, can we factor that some more? Sure. We could factor out a 2 out of the bottom, so we have 2y over 2 times the quantity of 2y minus 1. And now, since we have factors on the top that we can cancel, we can do that. And the final answer 
we have y over 2y minus 1. And we can't simplify that anymore. That's what x equals. If you have questions, please make sure you reach out. Let me know. Otherwise, thanks for watching.